Okay, I want you to imagine something that's not quite that nice, which is you go to the doctor for a regular checkup and it turns out there's something wrong. Something serious, potentially fatal, and you need treatment. Luckily, the hospital has two doctors on staff with two different treatments to offer you. And you're allowed to choose which one you want. And as you can see on the board, you see the survival rate of those two treatments. And you're allowed to choose. Obviously, most of you now think, why would I ever choose a Dr. B or go with Dr. A? Thank you. Now, what do you normally do when you have a serious medical problem? You find a second opinion. So you go to a different hospital that also has two different treatments, and they split up the data a little bit differently because they split it up into severe cases and normal cases. Now you might think, well, don't I need to know which case I am to make a good choice? And the answer is actually no, because if you look, you will see that Dr. B's treatment has a higher percentage in both categories, right? Meaning that in this hospital, you would prefer Dr. B. So, to repeat, in the first hospital, you'd prefer Dr. A. In the second hospital, you'd prefer Dr. B. The problem being, they're the same doctors. This is Dr. A in the first hospital and in the second hospital. And you can see I can either split his two cases, the normal and the sphere ones up, or I can just add them up and get an 80% rate. And the second doctor, the same thing. The problem being that although he's better in both categories independently, overall his percentage is worse. Now, I hope that those of you who heard this talk about statistics and started dozing off, that this grabbed your attention enough to listen to me for another 10 minutes. And what you've just experienced is called Simpson's Paradox, which means that depending how I split up data presented to you, I can get two opposite decisions from you. Now, Becoming Better Informed Citizen is the name of my talk, and I want to introduce you to the concept of statistical literacy. I teach mathematics, which means that the question that I hear most often is, when will we ever use this in real life? Admittedly, it's been a while since I had to differentiate something outside of work. However, I've come to believe that the single most important topic in mathematics that I teach in school is actually statistics. Because you will encounter it no matter what you do. It will be in the news, it will be in medical issues, maybe you go into research and you have to deal with it. I mean, even if you do psychology, you actually have to do courses in statistics to analyze all the data that's given to you. So there's no way around it. But as we've just seen, there are quite some problems you might encounter. Now, I'll go to another example of the uh, Simpson Paradox, which is a topic that's often in the news. The pay gap between men and women. Here I present to you three companies and show you their average income between men and women in those three companies. And the question is, which company is the fairest in regards to pay? So, I'll give you a minute to look at that. But most people will probably think, well, Technically, none of them are fair, because fair would be if it's the same for both, but in the first one, women earn too little, in the second one's a little bit better, but it's still below, and the third one, well, compensates the first two, but it's also not fair that they actually get more. The problem is, let's have a closer look. So, I've split up the worker, uh, workers in that company into manager positions, office workers, and support staff. And here you can see how many of those are male, how many of those are female, and how much they get paid each. The problem here is, well, it's not actually a problem, everybody gets paid the same on their level. But, because there are fewer female managers and office staff, the overall average goes down. Something that the one number of average doesn't actually tell you. Let's have a look at company B. Company B also has fewer women in the positions, but their pay is actually higher than their male counterparts. But the average is still a bit weird. And now, company C, where you have more women in the categories, which is good, but they actually get paid less. But the average is higher, meaning it actually looks good if you present that, let's say, in the news. So, the problem is, if you just compare the averages, you don't see any of that nuance. And you might completely have the wrong discussion, because the discussion could be in a company why there are fewer women in leadership positions, or why do people actually get paid differently for the same job? But to have the right conversation, you actually need to analyze the data appropriately, and we have this tendency to go for one number and one number only, and that's not always very productive. Now, 
I'm pretty sure there are a couple of people in the audience who think, well, this guy's teaching mathematics and he just says average, that's not very good. And you're right, because we're getting to the idea that there are actually different kinds of averages. The problem is when we speak normally in English every day, we don't actually say, we don't talk about the average, we talk about the mean. The thing that most people are familiar with, you add everything up and then you divide it evenly. That's the mean. The problem being, mathematically, there are more averages. Now, on the board, you have three classes and their grades. It's the IB system, meaning that 7 is the best grade and 1 is the worst grade. Now, which class did best on average? The problem is, if I take the mean, I get one result. Another average I can use is so-called median, which means that you bring the numbers in order and then you say the middle one. And the last one called the mode, which simply says which number actually occurs most often. The first class has these averages, the second one these, and the third one these. As you might notice, each class did best in one category. Meaning that if this was a, either in a newspaper or you actually discuss this, or the classes discuss with each other, every class has the right to say, on average, we were better. So whenever you hear here somebody say, on average, then the immediate response should be, well, which one? Talking a little bit more about averages, because it's really important, because our brains really don't like them. Our brains don't work well with averages. Because I'm pretty sure each one of you has often, or sometimes at least, heard the expression, the most likely outcome, whether that's in science, an experiment, maybe even politically, to say this will be the most likely outcome. The problem is, there's more to it than you might think. So, I flip a coin two times. That average should be that I actually get one head and one tail, right? What's the actual probability of that happening? 50%. Our brain likes that. What if I use 10 coins and flip them? You will still say, well, on average it should be five heads and five tails, right? The problem being that this actually happening has only a probability of 25%. Meaning that in 75%, something else than the average happens. And this actually gets worse as I increase the numbers. If I flip it 100 times, you would say it should still be 50-50, but that actually happening only happens in 8% of the cases. You might say, well, that's a neat thing, but why should I care? Now, thought experiment. You have a country with 10 major cities. Each city has 10,000 inhabitants. And there's a disease which occurs in roughly 1 in 10,000 people. So on average, every single city should have one of these cases, right? Now, assuming that these, this disease is actually random, and there are no factors about it, what's the chance that every city has exactly one sick person? Come up with a number in your head, and the actual answer is probably slightly lower than you thought. Now, why is that important? Because it means it's not one in each city, that means at least one city has two. And you can be sure that the mayor of that city won't like the newspaper headlines of saying that this city has twice the average, the national average rate of that disease. Maybe even three times, if there are three cases in the city. Maybe the citizens demand that time and resources will be used to fight off this problem and actually find out why their city has this problem in the first place. The problem is, in statistics, when you just have random events, clusters are actually to be expected. To visualize this, I will take a coin, and because I want to avoid embarrassing myself and not ever being able to flip it here, I now have it here. I want you, in your head, to decide if it's going to be heads or tails. So just think if this is heads or tails. It's tails. Please stand up if you were correct. Now, because every second person on average should be right, our brain kind of thinks it should be standing, sitting, standing, sitting, standing, sitting. But as you can see, that's far from the truth. And the problem is, should I actually go in one of the corners, maybe the two people standing next to each other who were both standing up now, and analyze whether they have the ability to predict the future? Or not. There's another group there in the middle. So looking at these clusters after the effect and trying to analyze why there is a cluster, cluster is not necessarily productive if you don't understand that clusters are actually to be expected. 
and you need to think about how big of a cluster will actually be a problem. Otherwise, limited resources and time and energy might be diverted in the wrong place. Please sit down. Now, I've been talking about percentages a little bit, and I'll stick with that for a moment. I have, in my kitchen, three eggs and two sausages, which means that I have 60% eggs, because it's three out of five. I feel like a snack, and I go into the kitchen and eat a sausage. Now I have 75% eggs, because it's three out of four. What's a valid conclusion that an outside observer might have if he sees Mr. Barakat enters the kitchen and the percentage of eggs goes up from 60 to 75 percent? <laughs> if the person doesn't know anything else, that might be a conclusion they get to. And the problem is, this is a silly example, but that actually happens in the real world. Imagine you have a city with different police precincts, and one precinct initi uh, initiates a new program, which is actually successful in reducing overall crime in their area of the city. What does that mean about the crime rate in the other precincts? It will go up. Although the actual number of crimes stays the same. Maybe your, your company, your department, does better, and suddenly everybody else looks worse, although they're still as productive as before. Of course you could say, well, relatively, they didn't improve it, you did, but to be honest, that's not what people think when they see a percentage go up or down. That's why I'm actually having this talk here. Another problem about percentages is when percentage or percentages change. Because if I say a percentage goes down by 10%, do I mean something like this? And it goes from 15% to 5, so it's reduced by 10%. Or do I actually mean it goes from 15 to 13.5. You might now say, why 13.5? Well, 10% of 15 is 1.5. So if 15% went down by 1.5, that's a reduction of 10%. Both of these are actually valid points. Meaning that if somebody actually talks about the change in a percentage, it's very important to know which case they're talking about. I'll come back to a medical example. The mortality rate for cancer, in some cases, halves if you do chemo. Now, the expression, the cure is sometimes worse than the disease, has its place. And when making the decision, you might be interested in, is this a drop from 20 to 10%? Or, is it a drop from 2 to 1%? Both are half. But if you're only told it halves, and you have to make a decision, you don't have necessarily all the information to make an informed decision. Sometimes, depending how a number is presented to you, it will produce a completely different emotional response from you. And I'll have an example here. Let's say an increase from 300 to 450 parts per million. And this is not supposed to be a climate change debate, it's just like this number goes up from 300 to 450. The problem is, if I don't want to express it in parts per million, but 0 0.03 to 0 0.045, no matter what you know, or what you believe, or what you feel about this, your brain will automatically have a different response to the above and the below numbers. Because our brains don't really work that well when dealing with numbers that are bigger than, let's say, how many fingers we have. So keep that in mind when a number is presented to you, either in a unit you don't know, or maybe in a context you don't know. Maybe somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I can deadlift 100 kilos. And you think, okay, I don't know what a deadlift is, but 100 kilos, I know that's kind of heavy, that sounds pretty good. And then you have the people who actually know what a deadlift is, and know that 100 kilo deadlift is not very impressive at all. So, when you're given information about something where you don't know much about, you probably need to look it up. Even for me, if I hear something that a power generator produces a certain amount of energy, or power, I don't know exactly, without looking up, how to put that into context with other sources of energy. Now, other problems are, again, as I said, if you're not given any context. So, for example, if I just put this number on the board, 4 million infants died in 2018, according to UNICEF. Obviously, everybody knows that's bad, and that number is really big, so you think, well, that's horrible. We should really, really do something about that. The problem is, do you have any other numbers to compare this to? Because, 
One year previously, the number was slightly higher. One year previously, it was still higher. In 1990, it was even more than twice as high. And the most important thing about this is, these are absolute numbers. So despite population growth between 1990 to 2020, the number of infants, so below one year, dying, has more than halved worldwide. The problem is, you don't know this unless you look at the numbers in context. So if I just show you 4 million, your brain says 4 million babies, that's obviously bad, so we should do something about it, and it's horrible. But the matter, as a matter of fact, is it's getting much better, and it's the best it's ever been. Now, when preparing this talk, I asked my brother for advice what I should include. His response was, everything you're going to tell them is absolutely obvious and it's completely irrelevant that you have this talk because everybody knows this already. He has a PhD in mathematics, so he has a very particular point of view for this. So I asked my sister, and she was a little bit more helpful, saying that I should, at the end of my talk, give you concrete advice what to do in the future, otherwise this was a pointless exercise. So here are three pieces of advice. First, when reading or being told about an average, the responses you should have are, what average are you talking about? And keeping in mind that our brain really likes to think the average should happen, and anything else, there's something wrong, but I hope I showed you that it's actually very unlikely that the average is going to happen in most cases, and so you should expect something else to happen. Secondly, beware of percentages. As I said, a percentage change, which one? Did it go down by 10% or 10% of the percentage I already have? It's most of the time very helpful if you're given a percentage of something to also ask for the absolute values to make a better informed decision. And finally, you need context for numbers. If you're just told a single number, this is the GDP of a country, nothing about the previous years, what am I supposed to do with that? So ask for numbers in comparison. And although I said three pieces of advice, the most important piece of advice is a single number never, almost never, tells the whole story. Unless that number is 42. Thank you.